achieve it. The historic goal of another Labour government. Our party, New Labour. Our mission, New Britain. New Labour, New Britain. to the audience, setting them, giving them a vision of a future Labour government, having to get rid of all dogmas, but staying true to traditional social values. That was his message. Detail will be sketched in later. He gave a broad framework of what he believes and how he hopes to achieve it. And there was a real worry that he might not be able to bring the audience alive, but they have been. And there was warm applause punctuating the speech. He stressed social re responsibility, attacks on the Conservative Party. He talked about the Conservatives' record on law and order. Said that if there's a yob culture, it's because the Tory philosophy has been the most effective yob creation scheme. And Tony and Cherie now go back to the platform. John Prescott shaking his hand warmly. Tony Blair looking slightly, almost embarrassed, he waves again to the audience. Labour Party not normally known for the lavishness of its uh, standing ovations, but they don't seem to want to sit down at the moment. I'm sure if Dennis Skinner won't be standing, he never stands for standing ovations. No, neither is Arthur Scargill. Now he's sitting firmly in his place. I don't think he found that much to cheer about in the speech. And now there's Pauline Prescott coming to join her husband John. And their offices are talking about the close working relationship that has already been developed between John Prescott and Tony Blair. There were many who had strong reservations about whether the two could work together for coming from very different strands in the party. And once again he waves and once again they don't want to let him go. I bet Tony Blair's beginning to think he feels like the conductor on the last night of the proms. I don't think one of the problems that Tony Blair thought he might have to confront when he started his speech was that he'd have to quieten the audience down at the end of it. He seems to be enjoying his moment. And there's Margaret Beckett standing, perhaps wistfully thinking what might have been. Had the result been different, perhaps it could have been her up there delivering that speech that he's delivered, that he's crafted on for days. He's been locked away with it. And Tony Blair sitting down. <laughs> Another curtain call. <laughs> Lord Callaghan, the last Labour Prime Minister, 15 years ago, standing to salute his young successor.
There was a tough message as well in his speech. Hopes were not born out of false promises, but disillusion is. When we make a promise, he said, we must be sure we can deliver it. That's page one and line one of a new contract between government and citizen. The alternative, he said, was disillusionment. And they sit down, he tries to sit down, but it's only Tony Blair and John Prescott that are sitting down, and up they stand again. Tony Blair was conscious during the leadership campaign of just how much hope was being pinned on him after 15 years of opposition. And you can see translated in the hall this afternoon, that's hope. And there's this real sense of relief that it has gone well. And finally, the audience does quieten down. I'm joined now on the platform by Baroness Gould, Joyce Gould, who was the former Labour Party director of... Uh, um, organisation. Oh, organisation, I'm sorry, in the excitement of that. What did you think of it? I, I, I think it was an absolutely amazing speech. I felt, if I can use the expression, completely gobsmacked by it. And I think that the, the delegates to the conference, with their, their rapturous but very genuine applause, actually felt very much the same way. I think they see Tony now as, without any question, the next Prime Minister, and I think they're going to do everything they can to make sure that he actually gets there. They've, he's given them that lead that they genuinely wanted. Joyce Gould for the moment. Thank you. Sheena? What do you think? What do you think? That's the only question being asked out here. The floor of all his delegates stream out after that speech. With me, two MPs and a union leader. First of all, John Denham, Southampton Pitchin. That's the question. What did you think? Oh, it's a great speech. I think what it did was set out very clearly what sort of Britain we would have with Tony Blair and the Labour government. That's what people wanted to see, some sense of what it would mean to them as individuals, and he did that very, very well indeed. Alistair Darling. It was an excellent speech, one of the best, I think, that's been heard for many, many years. He set out clearly the relationship between the government and individuals, and above all, he painted a picture of uh, a modern Labour Party going into the next century, and a modern Britain going into the next century. It was a very well-constructed and excellent speech. Rodney Bickerstaff, he also set out clearly where he stands on trade union reform. The reforms have gone through, there's no going back. Yes, I think, but we all knew that. He was uh, simply repeating something there. But he did talk about the right of people to be in a trade union. I think he gave a lot of hope to a lot of people, not just trade unions, but uh, uh, the elderly and particularly the young. He talked a lot about education, he talked a lot about full employment, and he's a sincere man, isn't he? Uh, I mean, there is this old line, if you can fake sincerity, you've got it made. He doesn't fake it. He really is sincere. He talked about honesty and straightforwardness, a driving speech. I think a lot of people uh, will imagine that uh, it's the best one that we're going to hear it from any of the leaders in this conference round. You have to emphasise, Alistair Darling, that we have to believe, or rather Labour has to believe in what it says, not, not say it because it thinks that those are winning policies, but actually mean what it says. Well, I think uh, Rodney just been saying that's the most uh, uh, refreshing part. Here is a man who speaks from the heart. Uh, he says what he means, and he means what he says. And politics needs that. There's far too many people who have become completely disillusioned by the way that British politics has been going, and Tony Blair speaks from the heart. And that is why I think that many people outside this conference hall will agree with what he's saying and realise that the Britain has got to change, and the only way it's going to change is with the Labour government and with Tony at the head of it. Change is the word, John Denham, isn't it? And he emphasised that at the end. There are more changes to come. More changes to come, but what he's done is he's moved us beyond the phase of saying, well, we're not this anymore, we're not that anymore. He's painted a picture of challenging what is wrong with Britain in a radical and a fresh way, a way that makes sense to people. It's a way that the party will believe in, and it's a way that people outside will believe in, too. John Denham, Alistair Darling, Roddy Bickerstaff, many thanks. John? Well, I'm joined now on the balcony by Bill Morris, the General Secretary of the Transport Union. Mr Morris, your reaction to that speech? Well, clearly, Tony today addressed not just the audience here, but he addressed the nation, almost a prime minister in waiting. But there was a new sense of freshness there. He stated some philosophical statements about responsibility, justice, uh, the fact that uh, opportunity is one of the hallmarks of what his government will stand for. But he also indicated uh, in, a, in a new way that there needs to be some truth in British politics, and I welcome that. 
How good? How many marks out of ten would you give it? Oh no, that, that's playing all politics. That political game start marking religious speech. Uh, I'm not into that. That's precisely what he, he was on about. Well, okay, we, are, we are giving an impression of a speech which was delivered to the nation by a prime minister in waiting, indicating what sort of government will he lead and what are the values by which his government will lead. And he said he also had to be tough as well as a leader and say no at times, and presumably some of the time he'll be saying no to people like yourself. I understand that. I'm a leader of a, one of the large trade unions in Britain. I'm constantly having to say no to people, but I also have the capacity to say yes and compromise when necessary. I'm sure he's got all that. You're quite sure? Absolutely sure. I've known the man a long time. He's a member of my union. and. All that he said today are qualities that I've always known that he's had. Do you think he has given Labour that image for the future that can lead it from opposition into government? It's not just about image, although we have to promote ourselves as a modern party in a modern world, but it's also about policies. It's also about caring about the sort of society we're going to live in. It's about how we treat our children, how we look after the old, the environment which we live in. And it's a new framework, a very fresh approach to politics that we've heard today. It was a very enthusiastic reception that he got. I mean, I'm sure some people will say he could have read the Blackpool Telephone Directory and still brought people to his feet, but even still, it was um, enthusiastic, wasn't it? Of course. Well, those who would say that, you know, the Telephone Directory would have done uh, cynics, really. Uh, but the reality is it was warm, it was very cordial, and it was a sort of, I'm one of the family, the community out there. And, and he really feels it. It's not just saying it. It was quite genuine. And it was an expression of the emotion that he feels. And that's the sort of leadership that's going to take Labour to the next general election. Bill Morris, thank you for the moment. I'm joined now by the Shadow Chancellor, Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown, was it the speech of the next Prime Minister? It was indeed the speech of the next Prime Minister. And as Bill Morris has said, it was a brilliant, indeed an excellent speech that I think uh, will raise, uh, will show the whole country that Tony Blair is ready to form a new government. It was about economic renewal, it was about social renewal, it was about constitutional change. Most of all, it was about telling the truth, winning the trust of the British people. And Tony Blair has shown that he is capable of holding that trust. And restating Labour's old values, but putting them in a modern setting. And that's exactly what Tony Blair is about. He's applying uh, lasting principles, the principles of a community helping the individual to all the challenges of modern times. Global economy, changes in the welfare state, changes in pattern of work. We are not afraid to face up to change. We will face up to change. But what Tony is saying, we will not make promises we won't keep. People must be able to trust us in a way they don't trust the Tories. And yes, and yes, and people have asked you in successive interviews that you've given over the past few days, and I'm sure they will say the same to Tony Blair, Where's the detail? We still have a, we have a broad sketch and outline, but where is the fine painting in? Well, as uh, Tony said today, uh, policies that we have laid down are very clear about what should be done now to get people back to work. Uh, we want to shift resources in our public services to end what he called the paper pushing and let the nurses nurse and the teachers teach. He's got a clear program of constitutional reform. But of course, we're not going to make commitments two and a half years in advance on economic uh, policy issues where we don't know the circumstances of the time. Just one very quick question. It's time we had a clear, up-to-date statement of the objects and objectives of our party. And that's what he said in this speech. What does that mean? Does that mean the end of Clause 4? Well, what uh, Tony has said is that he's going to put proposals before the party. Indeed, he and John Prescott together will put proposals before the party on the objectives of the Labour Party and our aims. And these are proposals that will be discussed by the conference. Gordon Brown, many thanks. We now go to London to join our newsreader, Moira Stewart. We will be back afterwards with more comment on this keynote speech of Tony Blair, the new Labour leader. Good afternoon, and the Labour leader, Tony Blair, has told his party conference the government's time is up and Labour is now the mainstream voice in British politics. He told an enthusiastic audience the Conservatives were feckless and irresponsible and that the Tory experiment is over, their philosophy is done, their failure is clear. Tony Blair set off for his first leadership speech knowing that the party conference was waiting for him to spell out his personal vision for the future. He began by claiming that Labour's journey back from the political wilderness was almost complete. Across the nation, across class, across political boundaries, the Labour Party is once again able to represent all the British people. We are back 
as the party of the majority in British politics, back to speak up for Britain, back as the People's Party. An uncompromising attack on the government followed with the Labour leader attacking them for incompetence. And then came Mr Blair's definition of socialism. A belief in society, working together, solidarity, cooperation, partnership. These are our words. This is my socialism. The speech, which seemed to please the audience, ended with a rousing appeal for delegates to unite behind him with head and heart. More than 3,000 investors in the Gooder Walker Insurance Syndicate at Lloyd's have won more than £500 million in damages at the High Court. It's the biggest civil lawsuit in British legal history. Lawyers had claimed that insurance agents had been negligent in failing to give sufficient warning about the risks. Representatives of more than 3,000 names whose affairs were managed by the Gooder Walker Agency arrived at the High Court this morning to hear judgment of their claim for damages totalling £630 million. The names alleged that the professionals who handled their business at Lloyd's had been negligent. They emerged victorious after being awarded compensation of £504 million, the largest award in English history. The explosion of the Piper Alpha oil rig in 1988, together with hurricanes and storms in 1990, plunged the Gooder Walker syndicates into the red. Today, Mr Justice Phillips ruled that the Gooder Walker underwriters had made no attempt to estimate how much money the syndicates would lose if a major catastrophe occurred. Several other action groups like Gooder Walker have claims pending for compensation, totaling a further £1.4 billion. Pounds. Those actions are now likely to be settled out of court, with thousands more names being awarded substantial amounts of money. The carmaker Ford has announced short time working at two of its plants. It blames a lack of demand in the UK market. Workers at Halewood on Merseyside will go on a three-day week for the rest of October, and there'll be no production for two days this month at Dagenham in Essex. The authorities in Japan have issued a tidal wave warning after a huge earthquake struck the country's northern coastline. The earthquake was centered just over 100 miles east of the northern island of Hokkaido, its effect was felt as far south as Tokyo, where it's said to have shaken buildings. There are no reports of any injuries. All roll-on, roll-off passenger ferries using British ports are to have their bow doors checked by inspectors from the Marine Safety Agency. The move follows the sinking of the Estonia in the Baltic last week. A film company has agreed to pay the widow of the comic actor Roy Kinnear £650,000. Roy Kinnear died six years ago when he fell from a horse during the filming of Return of the Musketeers in Spain. His wife said justice had now been done. I'm relieved that it's all over. It's been hanging over us for six years, and I'm just relieved that justice has been done. And I'm sorry that Roy's not here with us, but at least it has shown that British justice has been seen to be done. That's it for now. More news at six o'clock on BBC One. Good afternoon. There's a fine sunny end to the day in prospect for many parts of the country. But during the day we've been watching cloud and patchy rain pushing southwards across central and southern Scotland. Now a few showers affecting some areas in northeast England too. But many areas fine to end the day and dry and clear overnight. Clear in parts of eastern Scotland at first, but in the northwest the cloud and rain and strong or even gale force southwest winds will roll in later in the night. And for most of northern Britain, no frost tonight, but frosty conditions inland further south. Fine weather for much of central and southern Britain again during tomorrow, but a difference in the north. We're going to see cloud pushing some rain across northern and central Scotland during the day and increasingly strong southwesterly winds. Temperatures right the way from top to tail in the country around 13 Celsius. Bye bye. Now on BBC Two, Northwest Today with Felicity Goody. Good afternoon. A man who posed as a doctor at two Northwest hospitals has been jailed for five years at Preston Crown Court. Paul Bent pleaded guilty to nine hospital-related charges. Earlier, Mr Bent had admitted posing as a doctor at hospitals up and down the country. On Boxing Day last year, Paul Bent entered Royal Preston Hospital posing as a new locum. He spent six hours there chatting with other doctors. He stole a stethoscope and signed a prescription. 
Before he was discovered, he left by taxi and entered another hospital in Blackburn. There he stole some keys. He was later arrested. He's a man who has difficulty in telling the truth, but he's a very practiced uh, confidence trickster and he's very accomplished at carrying out the role of a hospital doctor. Sentencing Paul Bint to five years in prison, Judge Reginald Lockett said the public had great faith in the medical profession and that it was up to the court to see that wasn't undermined. The Ford Motor Company has announced short time production at its plant at Hellwood on Merseyside. The company has blamed slow growth in the car industry and poor sales of new cars. A three-day week will come into immediate effect and last for the rest of October, but workers will perform non-car production duties and will continue to be paid on Thursdays and Fridays. A bone marrow donor has been found for a three-year-old boy who may die without a transplant. Glenn Challenger, who's from Blackburn, has a rare form of leukaemia. Glenn's parents were told there was only a 100,000 to 1 chance of finding a matching donor. He's got to go in today for tests and things. He's got a few tests to undergo this week and then they're going to start an intensive chemotherapy course that'll last for 12 days. And then um, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, well, after the next couple of weeks, it, he'll, uh, he'll get his bone marrow transplant. There was disappointment today for the challengers. Glenn was taken to the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital to be prepared for the transplant, but he'll be returning home later today. The donor has developed a virus which has forced doctors to postpone the operation. A verdict of unlawful killing has been returned at the inquest of a Chester woman killed by a terrorist bomb in Turkey. 23-year-old Joanna Griffith suffered a fractured skull after being hit by shrapnel as the bomb exploded in the Mediterranean resort of Marmaris. And the weather, all parts will stay bright and fairly sunny, though there's a slight risk of showers moving eastward from the coast later on. It'll be cold, with top temperatures only 10 Celsius. And that's it for now. We'll be back with a full roundup in Northwest Tonight on BBC One at 6.30. Good afternoon. The NHS is at a crossroads. Hospitals are now run more like businesses. But where might it be heading? The NHS will become sort of franchise, uh, where you'll have a license to provide services which the taxpayer will pay for. Now, as private companies compete with the NHS, the government says it doesn't matter who provides health care. Is the health service in safe hands, or is it creeping towards privatisation? It's the investigation you can't afford to miss. The Health Business on Saturday at 5 past 7 on BBC Two. And now on BBC Two, we rejoin Hugh Edwards with the Labour Party Live. Good afternoon to you once again. Welcome back to the Winter Gardens in Blackpool, where I can tell you there's certainly a buzz after that first leadership speech by Tony Blair. The verdict here is that it was exceptionally well delivered and was certainly a radical offering. With me, two well-qualified observers of the scene, member of the Shadow Cabinet, Donald Dewar, and incredibly, as it seems, a backbencher, Roy Hattersley. Mr Dewar, you first of all, did that answer the critics who said that uh, Mr Blair is one big soundbite? I think he's just left him in uh, control of the party in a very real sense. I have taken part in very few genuine standing ovations in my time. That was 100% genuine. I think people were really thrilled and having got my breath back, uh, I still think it was a superb performance. Uh, he staked out the ground that he can call his own. Uh, the intensity of the commitment, for example, to education. Um, uh, the vision of how you make the British economy work and compete effectively, the constitutional reform, uh, I think it's a triumph really, and uh, there's no other word that can fairly describe it for Tony. Mr Hattersley? I give it every word of that, it started off good, it got better, it ended brilliant, and he caught the conference with his ideas. We were standing up and cheering because we believed in what he said and we agreed with what he said. It wasn't going through the ritual of applauding the leader, it was a radical speech, it was a very ideological speech, it was full of commitment for New Britain, and everyone down there believed it and shared the vision and the view. There was a surprise element towards the end of the speech, he kept it as a surprise for the end, where he suggested, hinted very heavily, the Constitution will be changed. Do you take that as reading that Clause 4, at last, will disappear? 
Well, I take it as looking at the Constitution as a whole. I personally hope that Clause 4 will disappear because hardly anyone who understands it really believes it or votes for it. Whether Tony wants to disappear must emerge with the weeks and months. But I don't believe they look at the Constitution as the most important part of the speech. The most important part of the speech with the vision of a fairer, more equal, more radical, more efficient Britain. That's the important thing he's heard today. Mr Dewar, what do you want out of that review of the constitution of the party itself? I think any constitution that was written in 1918 deserves review, needs review. I'm not worried about the docks and the commas. What I think we want is a statement um, uh, about the aims of the party, which relates to the real world today. What people want are jobs, what people want are hope. And what I think really emerged in this um, uh, speech was the honesty and the appeal to honesty, the commitment to honesty and realism. And I believe that will have a tremendous response, not just in the hall, which it got, but in the country at large. And Clause 4 to go? I don't know if Clause 4 will go as such, but I think there certainly will be additions. I think the Constitution has to say something about 21st century Britain, not about early 20th century Britain. And uh, that's important. But what's really important is what we deliver and um, the ground policy ground on which we stand the election. And it was brilliantly, brilliantly put in place today. Mr Dewar, Mr Hattersley, thank you both very much. Uh, Sheena? You, I've got three of Labour's women MPs with me, Kate Hoey, Angela Eagle and Diana. But picking up that point they were making up there, first of all, did you read in the, the last part of Mr Blair's speech that Clause 4 will be changed, altered, removed? Well, I think we're living in 1994. We need to look at getting a clear statement about our values and what the party stands for now. And so I don't think we're going to get into some big constitutional hassle. The important thing that came out of that speech today to me was the whole honesty of, of Tony Blair and the honesty that we're going to be able to present to the people of this country. People are fed up with politicians, they're disillusioned with politics, and I think that was the first step back to actually getting our party to be seen as a party that really can speak for Britain. It was a, it was a speech for the nation, not just to the nation. Angela Eagle, of the substance, what stood out for you? Well, I thought the analysis of what's wrong with Tory Britain and what's wrong with Tory philosophy was absolutely magnificent. And also, very important that he wants to banish cynicism, that he wants to say that politics matters and that if you believe in change, you can achieve change. Conservative governments always rely on apathy, and he's going to banish the apathy, and that's important when we have a Labour government to ensure that we get the trust of people and that they will support us in our efforts to change the face of Britain. But in this very important keynote speech, the leader's speech at conference, he did make a point, Diana, but of emphasising future constitutional change within the party. How do you read that? I think it was a very good speech. It got a very good response because what people want to do at this point is unite behind the leader and win the next election. Whether at what's really quite close perhaps the next 18 months. So such a close time before the next general election, we want to plunge into debates on the Constitution. I'm not entirely sure. So if he did mean removing Clause 4, changing it, changing the Constitution, you would not approve? We are in the run-up to an election. I think what people want to know from us is what we would do in programmatic terms if we were in government. Whether this is quite the right time to plunge into a constitutional debate around wording, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Abbott, Angela, Eagle, Kate, Hoey, many thanks. Thanks. You. Sheena, um, despite what Miss uh, Abbott was saying there, there's certainly a good deal of euphoria among the people in the hall and certainly outside. And I detect perhaps an element of surprise because though people expected Mr Blair to do very well, perhaps they didn't expect him to do so well. I'll ask uh, Harriet Harman and Neil Kinnock who are with me now. Uh, Harriet Harman, is that true? Do you think people thought, well, he'd do well, but actually this was far beyond our wildest dreams? Well, I think people are euphoric because they really feel that he's going to lay out a vision of what we stand for. And I think the, the ideas that we're going to engender trust and give people hope, those two things, that people aren't going to be told fairy tales, they're going to be told it straight, but they are going to be able to hope. And the idea of rousing the country from its apathy and its cynicism are messages that people in the floor of the conference very strongly believe in. So I think that what is important is he's setting out what we stand for, not loads of detail of policy. People first want to know what sort of party we are and what we stand for. And Tony set that out very clearly today, and I think that's what people were excited about. Mr. Kinnock, that was the best reception, certainly since your speech in 85. It was what for you was the best bit? Well, it was all good. I can't separate out anything, frankly, because in terms of performance presentation, it was brilliant. The building blocks of substance of policy approaches was magnificent. 
And of course, the way in which the integrity of this man came across so clearly, he so obviously believes with all of his intelligence and all of his being that there is a sense of purpose, a sense of direction, that we must make the country better. That's what will come across most of all. I thought he was absolutely ma magnificent. And even if I didn't like him, I'd say that, but I think he was great. I was yeah. so proud of him. His smile is almost as broad as yours, and he's got a smile on his face quite often. <laughs> There's steel there, though, isn't there? Yes, well, that's the great thing. You, you ask Harriet about the nature of the response to him in this hall. People voted for him. You got a very clear majority because they knew he was capable, he was attractive, he was highly intelligent, all those things, good reasons to vote for him. But they didn't really know last July is that this guy is truly a leader. I kept on saying it because I've known him, watched him, been his friend for a very long time. Today he demonstrated it, not in any arrogant sense, but in the sense of a true leader, somebody who wants the people to participate in the advance of our country, our society. You can't ask for better than that. Harriet Harman, that significant bit at the end of the speech where he talked about party constitution, I'm pretty sure Mr Kinnock would agree with what Mr Blair's aiming for there. Do you read that as being now the, the death sentence for Clause 4? Well, we're going to say what we're for, not look backwards, but actually redefine what we're for. Of course things have changed. I would be surprised if, having reconsidered our constitution, had a wide debate in the party about how we're going to say what we stand for, that we come up with the same form of words that we came up with 70 years ago. But I think following up the point that Neil made about what surprised people in the speech, I think that one thing that does surprise people is the amount of determination uh, that Tony seems to be showing. But the reason why he's determined, I think, is because he believes in what he's saying. So that's what gives him the strength and, and the passion and the commitment. So I think restating our aims in the run-up to the election is essential. It's part of rousing the country and rousing the party. Harriet Harman, Neil Kinnock, thank you both very much for talking to us. Uh, Sheena? I'm joined now by two union leaders, Bill Jordan of the EU and John Edwards of GMB. First of all, the substance. What did you hear that you liked, Bill Jordan? Well, I think I heard all that was wrong with uh, today's Britain and what Tony Blair's vision of what Britain ought to be, and anyone who heard that has no doubt now about either. But more important, I heard him asking us to talk truthfully to each other. He said, unless we're prepared to show that we can break with the past, people aren't really going to believe that we can build their future. He did say it was his vision, but there were particular pointers in there. No trade union reform, backtracking, he said, and constitutional change coming. You approve? Yes, I, I mean, I heard, I heard some of that, but he was uh, quite clearly, and it was a stunning performance. I mean, I've never heard a more uh, sustained reaction of support from the whole in 20 years. I mean, it was, it was quite, quite, quite amazing. But uh, his statement, commitment to full employment, unequivocal, but can't, can't do it... Can't be done on the first day. No, everybody knows that. Uh, but it can be done with determination. And he had determination and commitment to plenty today. And that's what I like. The national minimum wage, yes. The social chapter, yes. But rebuilding industry on the basis of partnership. I mean, the TUC has been saying this for years now. And he's now lining us up with the rest of Europe. A partnership economy. This is good stuff. Did you, did you hear the message that Clause 4 would go soon? Well, it's pretty difficult to rewrite the objectives and constitution of the party without considering Clause 4. But I have to say this, if the transfer of power to the people that he was talking about, if those terms are used, I don't think too many people are going to worry about a change in some of the language in the constitution. That was a radical sentence. A leader may lead, but the people govern, he said. What do you think he meant? I'm convinced that what he, he was... I, I think. <laughs> yes, sorry. It, well, it, no, but it, yes, it, it's, 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 it's a radical sentence. It, it is. The, the it, people yeah. govern. Presumably he's talking about taking devolving power as close to the grassroots, and he did talk about yeah. that. But what he was really saying to us is that we have got to make few promises, but make promises that we can deliver. And that really was probably the message the public wanted to hear. Yes, that's, that's it. Say what we mean, mean what we say. Let's have a bit less sleaze a bit less cynicism in politics, and if we can't do things, let's explain to the people. I mean, all this, is very, this, is, this is very impressive because not only did he say it, everybody in the hall believed every word because it was clearly his speech. I mean, this wasn't some uh, well-crafted performance. He was, he was saying this, this is what he means. I think that is notable. Everyone who's spoken to union leaders, 
delegates, MPs, are saying the same kind of thing. They're tremendously impressed both with the substance and with the style. He has achieved the unity without having to press the point, it seems. It's because he said what people wanted to hear. We have got to break with the past, and if that means anything at all, it means tackling the things that you call sacred cows. The Constitution is a sacred cow. It's a 19th century constitution, and he was saying the people out there want one for the 21st century, and he's going to do it. He's going to set down his vision in writing. Caution, not cu caution. Courage, not caution, was another watchword. Obviously, because you have to challenge the things that you've spoke about for so long and you've defended for so long, even though they've been out of date. And you've got to have the courage to say, that's ended. What is today? What is the future? What do the young people want? And then be prepared to start speaking for the future, not defending the past. Yes, and, and moving forward, you see, use this lovely phrase, no ditching, no dumping. What we do is not start by jettisoning things, but say, what does this country need for the future? And start from there. It was, uh, it was well written, it was well delivered, but it was also a statement of commitment. And the commitment is what came through most strongly to me and probably to the other delegates. John Edmonds and Bill Jordan singing in unison. Many thanks. You. Trina, with me, a key member of the Blair entourage, uh, Marjorie Molam. Welcome. Uh, the speech, we've said it time and time again, got a fantastic reception. A good suggestion at the end of the speech that there be constitutional reform, does that mean Clause 4 will go? I think what it means is there will be a debate and a discussion about the words that we need to use to put the beliefs and values that you, John Edmonds was just talking about in a way that the public can relate to. Tony made it very clear we won't win unless the public know what we stand for and they can trust us. And if we don't use a language in the gut of the party that they understand, then we won't get through to them. That's why that was an important part of the speech. So when conclusions are drawn in the press and media tonight, tomorrow morning, the clause for actually now is on its way out, you wouldn't dissuade people from saying that? What I would say is we're just having a debate internally about language, and that may seem a minor point, but the public are very distrustful of politicians. They know that sometimes, as the Tories have done, they promise too much. Tony made it very clear in page one, clause one, that we won't promise what we can't deliver, and we, what we must do above all else is say what we believe in, because the public needs to be sure before they can trust. They've had a government that's lied for so long. On tax, for example, we had more of the fair tax, not high tax, that kind of phrase. Um, he obviously was determined not to get into any more detail at this stage. Do you think that the entirety of the speech will have satisfied those critics who thought that, frankly, he was a bit short on policy? I think so. We've heard him talk in the speech today of full employment, minimum wage, right to join a trade union. He outlined with a, an emotional commitment about the future of education and the need for every child to have that basic right of an education and the, the need and the fear that people live with with crime. He highlighted those areas and said very clearly, we do have policies. We have policies in all those areas. We will put the, the rest of the meat on those bones in the run-up to the election. Oh, Kenneth Clark hasn't even got his interest rates out for the budget in a month's time. Why should we? We will in time, but what today was about to say, this is what Labour stands for, this is what we'll offer you. Dr Mullen, thanks very much indeed. Sheena? Thank you, thank you. I'm joined now by NUM President Arthur Scargill. Were you on your feet stomping and cheering? Arthur, it was a deplorable speech. It could have been made by a Tory wet, a Liberal Democrat or Hugh Gates still 30 years ago. It was an open declaration on the constitution of the Labour Party and a commitment to ditch Clause 4. Now, you read it as that. It's been hinted as that by other people, but they're not so clear. But you see it as an outright war on Clause 4. There's no question that it's an outright declaration of war on Clause 4. And it was also an insult to the conference, because as recently as yesterday, conference called for the repeal of all anti-trade union legislation. The leader today ignored that policy decision and said they had no intention of doing so. I find that deplorable. Well, in fact, the composite that you moved yesterday was rejected in a card vote by conference. And Mr Blair went out of his way today to, to say that any such talk really was not for conference and he rejected it and it would not happen. With respect, if you looked at the other composite, which was adopted unanimously, that called for the repeal of all anti-trade union legislation. But Mr Blair today not only rejected that composite which was adopted, but went further and said that he accepts the principle of the free market. I find that astonishing. Isn't this a case of they're all out of step except our Arthur? No, it's a case of they're all out of step by those who accept the constitution of the Labour Party. If Tony Blair had been a bishop, he would now facing a charge of decrying the birth of Jesus Christ. So you're calling him a heretic? 
Well, a heretic in the sense that he's decrying the constitution of the Labour Party. I would have thought that it was incumbent upon any leader of the party to speak in line with its constitution. And its constitution is clause four, which calls for the common ownership of the means of production. He today declared war on that. So why did John Edmonds call it the most effective speech he'd heard in 20 years? Why is there effectively a love in delegates from the constituency parties, from the unions, MPs, obviously cabinet members, are all saying the same thing. Excellent speech, good message, it will unite us. Probably because the same sort of thing was said by John Edmonds' predecessors when Hugh Gateskill made a similar speech 30 years ago. They were wrong then and he's wrong now. Let me move to our political correspondent. Arthur Scargill, stay there for a moment. Nick Jones, you've been getting the, uh, the bus here. Now, is, is Arthur Scargill a lone voice here? No, he's not a lone voice. There is a lot of concern on the left uh, that uh, this is... Mr. Blair's intention. Mr. Blair has just walked through the press room here with John Prescott. They've been challenged immediately as to whether or not the redrawing up of the Constitution does mean the dropping of Clause 4. Mr. Blair said in response to questions it would be a comprehensive look at the Constitution of the party, but Mr. Prescott did go further. He said yes, it does mean looking at fundamentals like Clause 4, and that I think is what has so alarmed MPs, especially on the left of the party. Uh, Diana, Diana Abbott has already said that she thinks this could come back to haunt Tony Blair because of the divisions. But there was a time when one would have called John Prescott on the left of the party. I mean, can we make those distinct left-right divisions? It is a difficulty, I do accept. Uh, and one of the, uh, I think, strengths, this is certainly from the leadership's point of view, is that Mr. Prescott is going to be in there with Tony Blair looking at the Constitution. Now, Roy Hattersley, a former deputy leader, has said that is going to be one of the great strengths of this exercise, which Mr. Blair is obviously so keen on, that uh, there will be someone from the left with an input, like John Prescott, who will perhaps be able to temper what's being done. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, briefly, Arthur Scarza, who in the leadership do you put your faith in? Dennis Skinner. Thank you very much. John. And in the hall, perhaps fittingly, they are discussing the relationship of the trade unions to the Labour Party. At the platform, the outgoing General Secretary of the Labour Party, Larry Whitty. The organisation will replace TUFL, that will involve all unions and will provide support to party organisation and finances at election time, regional, national elections, local elections, European elections but it will also provide a sounding board and focus for discussion on matters of common interest more broadly. And it will also provide for a trade union liaison office based in Walworth Road to ensure a better communication between the trade union political organisation and the parties. Last Wednesday, the NEC uh, ag agreed that we'd establish this organisation whereby the general secretaries of affiliated unions uh, and the, leading, the leader and other key members of the front bench and the NEC would meet three to four times a year. Now, many of the operations of this new organization will be similar to those of TUFL. It will have a wider mandate, it will be more clearly integrated with the party, and have a comprehensive membership of affiliated organizations. Positively, it will provide a focus for our approach to the next general election. Negatively, if you like, it will try to avoid misunderstandings and the clashes that occurred last year during the OMOF confrontation, uh, a clash which this party cannot afford again. Chair, yeah, I would like to say this is a very positive move forward. I thank all the trade unions that have played part in those discussions, uh, and I would hope that we could agree that we move, in principle, along these lines today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Larry. I'm going to move straight and to the And a rather empty hall so now after the leader's speech as they go away to... And those against... Well, that's carried. Thank you very much indeed. Just sorting myself out because the dog's come back. Lucy obviously gone away Send briefly and out on my behalf for a cup of tea. Uh, that's a hint that nobody's brought me one at all this afternoon. Uh, so that was uh, that was carried. So um, I'm just going to make sure I know where I am. Right. We're now uh, moving on, colleagues and comrades, to uh, uh, the uh, regional structures debate and this is composite 66 and I'm asking the mover and seconder to come and do that please. What's happening now in the conference is a uh, debate which, coming on the heels of uh, Tony Blair's promise of devolution of power, it's an internal battle within the Labour Party between the Yorkshire uh, 
Labour Party and the North East Region Labour Party and they want it to merge into one party and the North East, the Geordies, aren't very happy that they're going to be mixed up um, with the Yorkshire Party and they're saying there's absolutely no need to do this but let's go outside the hall now for more of the buzz on the speech and join Sheila. John, thank you. And before we do that, let's have a look at the men and women, but principally men, who worried as much as anybody about how this afternoon's speech was going to go down. They're the backroom boys, popularly known as the Spin Doctors. Steve Richards report. A Westminster party to celebrate the retirement of a journalist. But of course politicians are there too, because it's at social gatherings like these that the Westminster village really gets to know itself, with politicians and journalists feeding off each other. There's Peter Mandelson, Labour's former top spin doctor, who knows the value of private conversations with journalists. And his successor, David Hill. When you hear about Labour Party sources, it often means him. As for Bernard Ingham, he had the more elevated title of Downing Street Sources when he was Margaret Thatcher's secretary, meeting the press twice a day. These behind-the-scenes operators are unique in that they have access to both politicians and the journalists. Outside, the atmosphere is relaxed, but nobody ever stops playing the game here. Journalists are looking for a new line, and spin doctors want to make sure it's the best possible one for their party. The man being wooed on the right is from the sun, David Hill obviously sees it as time well spent getting a message across to a paper which helped the Tories win the last election. The victor of that election couldn't keep away from such a gathering, even though relations with the press have been poor. So it's that man from the sun again who's been targeted by Chris Mayer, the Prime Minister's press secretary, a civil servant rather than a party official this time, but what he would give for sympathetic coverage from this particular tabloid. Because the reality is, John Major, Chris Mayer, and all politicians and press officers are obsessed with the media. But do their attempts at news management really work? Now more than ever, when the two parties are really fairly close in ideological terms, the differences between them are fairly narrow, and in, in many ways, the difference between them is one of, it can often be one of imagery. And so the, the role that the press officers and the, and the spin doctors plays is absolutely vital as, as, the, as the ground gets closer between the two parties, the role that interpretation and spin doctoring has becomes more important. Those who voted for the Liberals. And they never stop in the Westminster Square Mile. Here the Tory chairman and his chief press officer debunk a Liberal Democrat launch. But the harsh reality for spinners is that when things are going badly, journalists rarely oblige. Yes, sir. The Conservatives' own pre-conference launch coincided with a gap the day before from the party chairman and a rise in interest rates. Not surprisingly, press officers looked on anxiously like security agents for an American president, fearing perhaps more own goals. The official news conference was the first attempt at damage limitation, but the real work begins after all this has ended. These conversations with journalists and Conservative officials are off the record. No doubt the officials are playing down any further gaffes from their chairman and the impact of a rise in interest rates. But bad news is bad news, and it didn't work. The newspapers led with the interest rate rise on their front pages and interpreted it as alarming the Tory grassroots. And on the inside pages, the Tory launch was written about in terms of another gaffe. At the end of the day, there's a limit to how much can be done. I think press spokesmen and press operators have to remember that their job is a long-term job. It's to win the next election. It is not to get the headlines in tomorrow's newspapers that you would want, if it undermines your credibility in the long term. But Tony Blair is enjoying a honeymoon and hasn't had to deal with the bad press as yet. He's new, and journalists are therefore especially receptive to stories that policies are about to change. This conference on the economy had been preceded by intensive briefings to the press for the previous three days. The conference wasn't about detailed labor policies for the economy. 
Gordon Brown and his press officer were only one source of the reports others in the Labour Party were briefing too, leaving them with mixed feelings about the over-the-top reports which followed. They gave the impression that a new detailed economic blueprint was about to be presented when that was never going to be the case. With me, Steve Richards, the BBC's political correspondent who made that film, and the Observer's political correspondent who used to be a spin doctor himself, Andy McSmith. First of all, you're a reporter. Do you need spin doctors? How important are they? Well, I think they're important, but their role has been overplayed uh, over the past few years. I think in the sort of Peter Mandelson era of the Labour Party, and a lot of myths arose about their importance. Is it we over? Well, no, we saw there, for example, Charlie Whelan, uh, Gordon Brown's press officer and his advisor, Ed Balls, briefing intensively at the economic cr uh, conference that they held last week. But most of what they are saying will be interpreting what has happened, trying to inform and not to distort or lie, uh, as some might suspect. So it's not as sinister most of the time as perhaps the wider public might think when we refer to sources and all these anonymous people. Where I think they probably do count is at times when there is a news vacuum, there isn't much happening, and they can suddenly go around briefing people, especially the Sunday correspondents, as Andy is now, on a Saturday, and say, look, we've got this coming up next week, you haven't got much else going on. And that suddenly becomes a front-page story on the quality uh, newspapers, and then the BBC follow it up, and actually what isn't very much of a story becomes quite big. Now, that's where they play an important role, but most of the time they're providing useful information. Annie McSmith, you were at Walworth Road. You're now poacher turned gamekeeper, as it were. Steve Richardson, that film, suggests the spin doctors regularly fail. Would you agree? Oh, yes, and, um, I mean, the Labour Party had the best spin doctors around in the middle 80s, uh, right up to 92, the best spin doctoring operation the Labour Party was second to none. They were lost two general elections on it. And what happened in the party is there was a terrific backlash inside the party after 92, so that people like that lost their influence then, and it's coming back a bit now. Is it that politicians don't trust the press, that they feel they need those middlemen, those spinners, to put the best possible slant on it, in whatever no. the way they, they, they may? Or, or are they spinning against the press? No, there's just there's such an endless demand for news. I mean, here we are, you know, going, this is, program is going on all day. These are pearls of wisdom. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But, but, you know, all day, every day, there are programs, newspapers, wanting a little bit more, a little bit extra. So uh, there's lots of... Uh, opportunities to go running around saying, you know, have you noticed such and such? And, and briefly, Steve, are the spinners out at the moment after that speech? Oh, yes, they'll be out putting the best possible bow on it. But you see, if it was a flop, I'm not saying it was, but if it was, there's very little they could do to change that. So that's an example of their limited role. But what Andy said there was very interesting. Because of the endless expansion of outlets, not just your pearls of wisdom, Sheena, but other programmes as well, um, what some of them are now saying is it's very rare to see all those people in, on, on the screen as we've just done, but some of them think the demand is so much now for politicians, they're actually going to have to appear on air sometimes as official spokesmen because the politicians will be too busy. So we might get to know some of them a bit better rather than seeing them as these sinister behind-the-scenes shadowy figures. And maybe that'll happen in the course of this week. John, or is it you? It is you, Gina, thanks very much. And we heard Arthur Scargill saying earlier on that uh, he was placing his faith in the NEC on the shoulders of Dennis Skinner. Mr Skinner is with me now. Mr Skinner, thanks for joining us. The speech, there was a big hint at the end of the speech about the party's constitution. Did you agree with Mr Scargill's interpretation that that was basically the end of Clause 4? It could be. I mean, what he's asking for is a rewriting re re of the constitution of the Labour Party, and the Labour Party's constitution is usually referred to in the media as the cornerstone, namely Clause 4. And I think it was totally unnecessary to be introducing that theme he had got the conference in his hands, really, until that time. And, of course, I only recall Gates School doing the same thing in 1959. And he said that he was going to get rid of Clause 4, that we couldn't win an election if we had it, and then we managed to save Clause 4 of the Constitution. What happened? Harold Wilson won four elections, one after the other. So it's not true to say that uh, Clause 4 is a hindrance to being elected to power. Do you accept the argument that if as Mr Blair is doing, talking about a dynamic market economy, he repeats that time and time again, that that can't be squared with the declaration of public ownership in Clause 4. Well, I'm not so sure about what he meant by a market economy, because on the one hand he said he wanted to do business with the pu public and the private sector, and then in the next breath he wanted to get rid of the speculators and the spivs in the city. Now, you know, there was a bit of a contradiction there, so I'm not too sure what he means by the mixed economy. If you're going to drive out the people with the money, 
and that you're going to control the financial levers because if you drive out the speculators and the spivs in the city, that's what you mean. And so I'd like to see the small print of that little bit. Do you accept that he's a radical? Uh, well, radical covers a lot of things, as you know. People use that term radical, both for the right and the left. So I think it's a bit of an abstract generalisation. Uh, he did use the word socialist and he said that it was important. And so to that extent, I believe him. You accept but I do, I do want to impress upon the people around him that if they go down the road of meddling with the Labour Party's close four, at a time when we've got the Tories on the run, when the health service is in crisis and the education system is in ruins, when there are four million people without work, we've got all these things to concentrate upon. We can't be messing about examining the Labour Party's own constitution. The people out there won't understand it. You will provide headlines in the media about all this argument about Clause 4, when all these people need help. The pension has been robbed blind by the Tories. That's what we have to talk about. And I think it is a total unnecessary diversion. And you'll be telling him that when you get back on the Without NEC? Without any question whatsoever, I will say at the first NEC meeting, I hope that we're not going to get down this road, because Neil Kinnock under his leadership changed the constitution four or five times in the course of his leadership, and what happened? We lost both elections. Mr Skinner, I don't want to go down that road Thanks again. very much indeed, John. And in the battle between what some have described as the Yorkshire Tykes and the Geordies, we now have Mr John Prescott. It's not a Marnie, in case you put the room around. 